it's very, very popular and, and it's one of those things I wish I'd invented, you know, like 3M Genius. post-it notes and, and Velcro. <laughs> but it's it's basically like speed dating, but at conferences. Otherwise, you're wandering around knowing that you're interested in X, Y and Z, but there's no easy way to to connect with people. So it, it is such a great opportunity to find people who are either having you know the same problems as you or you want to talk through problem solving, brainstorming sessions, open discussions, storytelling. It really can be anything that you want. So it's a great opportunity to jump in and host a topic on the, on the Brain Date Marketplace saying, hey, I need help with X, Y, and Z. And some of the connections people make have gone on to be incredibly valuable and productive. So what are you missing out on? You're missing out on Brain Date. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Koala News. I'm coming to you from Wajuk Noongar country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society coming to you from Garrigal Land. God, I've made a mess of that, haven't I? Garrigal Land in Sydney. It's one of those things you say it all the time, do you think you get used to saying it by now? And welcome to Global Horizons. We've got a chunky episode for you today and obviously a lot of interesting stuff going on around the industry that we're going to unpick and unpack for you. A little bit later in the episode, but we thought we'd try something a little bit different this time. And by way of getting into the news, we thought we'd actually start by looking at the future. And Dirk, we're joined again by Sally Gatenby from IDP. And it's so good to have you here, Sally, because everyone's had such a heck of a start to the week. Yeah. (laughs) It'll be nice to talk about some good news on our way to the rest of the news. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me again. It, it's always a delight to come on and uh, and talk to you about AIEC. But yeah, it has been a fairly hefty week. And I suppose this is almost like a bit of a palate cleanser before you get into the real guts of the, the podcast. <laughs> a palate cleanser. I love it. Love the analogy. Ah, uh, look, it is what it is. Look, it's a, been a big year for international education. And I think that that's something that we're seeing reflected with AIEC. We've had over 1,100 registrations so far. So very strongly wow, in line pre- as per previous years. We've been expecting sort of 16, 1,700 and we're on track to get that this year. So really, really pleased to see that people are choosing AIEC. To, uh, if you're having to pick one conference, it's it's got to be AIEC. So we're really seeing that reflected. You know what, just pausing there for a second, I know with other conferences, post-COVID, generally conference face-to-face attendance has been down. So that's, I mean, that's a real feather in your cap. Congratulations. And obviously, obviously, the macro environment at the moment probably helps people wanting to get together and, and hear what's going on in the latest time. But even still, I mean, generally, conference attendance has been down. So um, that's, a, that's a really good sign for you. Congratulations. We're really, really pleased to to have that result. And I suppose that just speaks to how important this is to the sector and getting everybody in a room together. I think last year we interviewed Rob at AIC in, in Adelaide and he was like, you know, you've got to come. You have to come. Everybody who's anyone within international education is here and we've got him in a video on our website as part of the promotions as to why on earth should you come to AIEC there you go that's the reason why uh, why attendance is up yeah it's, it's, it's Rob it's basically Rob no no credit <laughs> <laughs> I remember that it was actually really fun I think you guys mugged me I can't remember we where did. you mugged me but it was somewhere in the conference hall and you're like can you say why it's important to be and I was like hell yeah I can <laughs> It's the greatest soundbite, so you're pretty much immortalised forever on the AIEC um, videos now. But yeah, this is the sort of thing that people do come to AIEC because literally everybody comes. But quite a few things have happened since I spoke to you last. I think it was about two months ago I spoke to you. We have announced some of our keynotes, which is pretty exciting. We've got Stan Grant. He's returning again as, as our MC because he's just fantastic at it. And we're really happy to have him back on board the other person that we've announced is Jordan Nguyen, who's the Australian engineer. And I think I spoke about him last time. But we've since announced we've got Dr. Diane McGrath. Now, she's an environmental engineer and she's actually been circumnavigating the world in a big sort of yacht. Her focus is mainly on sustainability. She's got some really, really interesting thoughts about how we can prepare for the future and I think some interesting thoughts about what we're going to do within international education, not only from sustainability as in the planet, but in how we can sustain our sector. The other one is a really interesting guy called Abbas Nazari and he's a former Afghan refugee. He fled the Taliban. He was one of those asylum seekers who was on the Tampa. Do you remember the Tampa in 2001, which was that hot topic for the election. He was denied asylum in Australia, but he eventually resettled in New Zealand. And he basically hit the ground running, didn't speak any English, eventually was a Fulbright scholar at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and has written a book about 
what it means to be an international student and what the impact of that has been on his life. So really meaty story there. Yeah, what a story. What a story. Yeah. We missed that one, didn't we? I mean, maybe I'm going to show myself as a little bleeding heart lefty, but like what a missed opportunity for this country. So look look at the extraordinary people that uh, are fleeing for their lives. I mean, he, he, he could have been ours. He could have been ours, absolutely. <laughs> like Crowded House could have been ours. To be fair, look, he's now a Kiwi and we can totally take credit for Kiwis. So let's do a Russell Crowe. Let's just climb in. In the grand tradition of Australians co-opting Kiwi uh, things, I say that he can be an honorary Australian <laughs> I'm sure he's got some thoughts on the subject. You know, true story. I'm, so I'm going to dive into this stupid little actor. Having backpacked all over the place, I sometimes feel like New Zealand, being a Kiwi, is like the most exclusive club on earth. It sort of has all of the advantages of being an Australian, but then like this extra status of just being one of so many fewer, you know, I've always felt a little bit envious of our Kiwi colleagues traveling around the world, just being like, I kind of want to be one of them. I'm envious just because of how the blood is like up for so damn long. <laughs> 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 my dad was a Kiwi. A lot of my family were, were Kiwis, and, and so we've got a lot of crossover there. But um, I've, I've only ever been twice, once when I was six months old and once for a week for what was a, a bit of a holiday. But it's a gorgeous country, and the innovation and the brains. Uh, Australians, uh, we're very much global thinking. We look outward and we're innovative because we've had to be in many respects because of the tyranny of distance. And New Zealand even more so, the amount of incredible design, creativity, innovation, technology, just a really interesting little microcosm of concentrated people and cheap, effectively. Look, I'm, I'm glad he found his feet there and we're very, very pleased to have him part of AIC this year. And I think he's going to be great. He's going to be on Friday as part of our closing plenary lineup. Now, Sally, you've been stalling. I know you've been stalling. In fact, you guys have been stalling for months. We we want to know. We want it, Dirk. We you know I know I you want to know, Dirk. You know what I'm talking about. It's the question on everybody's lips. And for those people who have hacking skills and been able to hack into the AIEC website, maybe you're already privy to this information. But for those of you who aren't equipped with such skills, what is the conference dinner theme? Oh, people don't want to know about that, Rob. Do they really? Yes, they do. I know it's Give like the, information. the number one thing. Actually, that's not true. The The question always is, where are we going next year and what's the dinner theme? The dinner theme, well, we're, this is going out on Friday. So the conference dinner, which is sponsored by IDP Education, will be da, 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 it's called Hollywood Nights. And the idea around this is a Hollywood Oscars after party, red carpet, lots of stars, paparazzi. You can dress up as your favourite movie star or movie character or a director or you can just wear a a nice outfit as if you were going to a premiere. The idea is to just have a nice movie-themed evening. We've got lots of fun stuff planned for you. Uh, It will be held at the Medallion Room in Marble Stadium and there might even be some paparazzi there. Not sure. Please come along. Please dress up. We've got prizes for people who make a really big effort. And if you and your team are coming along to AIEC and want to perhaps do an ensemble cast, there will be prizes for that as well. So the idea is a night of glitz and glamour if you want to, but equally if you've always wanted to be Rambo or you've always wanted to be James Bond or you've always wanted to be Marilyn Monroe, please feel free. Dress up. Come along. It's going to be a really, really fun night. I think that uh, has just laid down the challenge to you, Rob. I already know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I met John on an earlier podcast that I've come up with this formula now for the AIC conference dinner, which is the first thing that comes into my mind when I hear the theme is what I'm committed to going as. So, yeah, I've, I've already got it. So you're spray painting gold and going as, as an Oscar? You could. I have a bit of time up my sleeve to, to do the prep work on this one. Quite pleased. Ooh. Ooh. So, what will Rob dress up as? I'm more interested in what Alex Vaninsky is going to dress up as. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all very interested to see what Alec will be dressing up as. But yeah, there's all, every year there's somebody who makes a really great effort, and we will see who it will be this year. But yeah, prizes, fun, who knows what you will see. But it's going to be the venue is going to be absolutely perfect for this. We've got a great band, lots of dancing, lots of great food, lots of entertainment. So a really good opportunity for everybody to come together and um, hit the dance floor. The other thing that's out this week is the full, 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 full conference program. Yeah. So it, it's game on now, isn't it? Like we can finally get in there and actually plan our entire conference. You can. So as of Friday, 
uh, which is today when this goes out, we have the full online program. We've previously released the the program at a glance or the preliminary program, which just has the sort of titles of the sessions just to give people a bit more information. This is where we can you can really get into the guts of what each of these sessions will be about. And there's a lot. There's over there's 100 sessions and uh, over 200 speakers on the program this year. So this allows you to look at the the abstract, what the learning outcomes and objectives are, and and you'll be able to start planning your conference now with by the format that you like, whether it's a panel session or whether it's a campfire, which is a bit more loosey goosey, or by your preferred KIAs or key interest areas. So we've got indications on each of these where you can you can filter and sort by whichever types you prefer and just sort of start to map it all out. Aside from that, it's is sorry, is Brain Date already open for us to get in? No, there? no. Okay, so the app. So the conference app will go live um, on the eighth of of October, and that's when we'll have the we'll have the Brain Date Marketplace open up, and that is where you can go in and start choosing all your Brain Dates, etc. The other thing that we've got happening when we launch the app is a really cool and new for this year program called the Conference Quest, and this is a basically a treasure hunt. And over the week of AIEC via the app we're encouraging people to go around and solve the, the clues. So whether it's taking a photo or whether it's a particular word, it's a way to really get delegates to everything at um, AIEC and delegates can win some really cool prizes sponsored by Adelaide Uni. So some of the prizes that we've got lined up are pretty nice, I have to say. But if you've ever done a scavenger hunt, whether it was at university, whether it's school, whether you've done geocaching, it's that type of fun thing that, that we've implemented for this year. So we're really interested to see how people take that and run with it. But I'm I'm really excited to see how it goes too. So yeah, that's pretty much a big update from the AIEC world. Next time, I think we'll get Sham and or Louise to come on and talk about more of the program stuff. Looking forward to it. And one last little shout out about the brain dates. So the, the app is out on the 8th of October, you were saying, which is about five weeks out from now six weeks i'd really strongly suggest to anyone that's going along to the conference this year if you think you're going to be there to already start thinking about that in advance honestly last year that was such a discovery for me a chance to sit down with colleagues from a range of different areas and just dive into a specific area and and i really feel that if people are already starting to think about that now a month out about the sorts of things you really want to get out of the conference what are you there for is it to learn about the caps in details? Is it to learn about learning abroad? Whatever it might be, I really think Brain Date is just an incredible opportunity for you to sit down with half a dozen of Australia's best thinkers on that topic and dig in. So start thinking now about what you really want to get out of this conference and and start thinking about who you might want to sit around the table with. Yeah, it's very, very popular. And, and it's one of those things I wish I'd invented, you know, like 3M Genius. post-it notes and, and Velcro. <laughs> but it's... It's basically like speed dating, but at conferences. Otherwise, you're wandering around knowing that you're interested in X, Y, and Z, but there's no easy way to to connect with people. So it's, it is such a great opportunity to find people who are either having you know the same problems as you, or you want to talk through problem solving, brainstorming sessions, open discussions, storytelling. It really can be anything that you want. So. It's a great opportunity to jump in and post a topic on the on the Brain Date Marketplace saying, hey, I need help with X, Y, and Z. And some of the connections people make have gone on to be incredibly valuable and productive. So what are you missing out on? You're missing out on Brain Date. Amazing. Sally, thank you for being a little ray of sunshine in this cloudy, grey, miserable week that's, that's engulfed us. Look, it's AIEC. Somebody described it to me once as summer camp for international education. And I fully subscribe to that. It is a great opportunity to get everybody together and really talk about this. And this year, I'm hoping that it's going to be a sense of support and healing and collaboration and everybody leaving renewed with a vigor to, to go, right, what, what's next? What's, what are we doing now? And off we go with that sort of great momentum that I know that the, the conference always delivers. So I'm really excited. I'm sure everybody else is too. I am. Yay. Excellent. Thanks for joining us again, Sally. My pleasure, lads. See you in October. 
You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIEC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities, from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Well, Dirk, fantastic to have Sally with us. I wish that part of the conversation had gone on, but I suppose we should probably get to the actual news now, shouldn't we, mate? <laughs> Let's do it. It is a news podcast after all, right? So. It is a news podcast, and holy smokes, we've got a lot to talk about Starting off, well, where do you want to start? Are we starting off with Senate hearings? Are we talking caps? Where, where do you want to jump in? Mate, this just seems to be so much that's integrated at the moment. Yeah, I mean, let's start with the caps. And I mean, yesterday, we uh, obviously for listeners, we're recording on a Wednesday for a release on Friday. Caps were released yesterday, or should I say national planning levels. So there's a whole series of new kind of nomenclature that's come out around the caps. So the new national planning levels. No, I think you call them euphemisms, Dirk. <laughs> e- euphemisms? <laughs> So yeah, so they were announced yesterday, obviously a press release by a number of ministers, um, headlining by uh, by Jason Clare, the Education Minister. Yeah, look, I mean, by now, I think most listeners would know what's in there. But, you know, from a top line, the I guess the, the magic number is 270,000 commencements for international education or for international students for the calendar year 2025. I guess that needs to be prefaced by the fact that the bill, which is before, still before a Senate committee at the moment, needs to be passed, I guess, in its current form or without amendments around the minister being able to make these determinations. If it is not, then obviously it goes on the back burner. And depending on what uh, any amendments that may be made to the bill uh, that may impact this, that also needs to be considered. So this discussion is very much predicated on the point that the bill gets through and the minister has, has the power to do this. So there's a watch and see sort of bit there. So 270k is, is the top line. And luckily, uh, we had that broken down in the press release. So there's three kind of breakdowns of that. The first one is around publicly funded universities. They're going to be allocated about 145,000 places. And the government seems to think that's around the 2023 levels. Now, I'm going to put an asterisk on that because I want to come back to that number specifically because that, that's going to be really, really important to, to understand how that's broken down. I'll quickly just mention the second one, which is, I guess, for other universities and non-university higher education providers. So we're talking, I think, Bond University, Torrens, and other higher education providers. That will be around 30,000. So again, when we look at that, how does that sit in the overall scheme of things? Um, I think the numbers need to be broken down probably a little bit more there, but we'll see how we go. The last one is around VET, and there's been 95,000 places allocated for VET. Now, how does that look against the numbers currently and the numbers at the end of last year? Long story short, if there's 145,000 international for the public universities, there are approximately 150. 2,000 new higher education commencements in 2023, excluding higher degree research. So one could argue at a top level, that's actually not too bad. I mean, it is a decrease of a little bit, excluding higher ed, but here's the asterisk. There's a number of carve-outs. So the carve-outs to this, now I'll read all the carve-outs and then I'll come back to higher education. School students, a higher degree by research students, students undertaking standalone English programs, non-award students, including short-term exchange students, Australian government sponsored scholars, students that are not part, uh, sorry, that are part of an Australian transnational education arrangement or twinning arrangement. That's the one I'm going to talk about. Key partner foreign government scholarship holders and students from the Pacific and Timor-Leste. So if you're thinking... Sorry, just for clarity, Dirk, when you're talking about carve-outs, those groups of students, school students, higher degree by research, etc., they are excluded from our 145,000. So they're excluded from the 270, and that's what I'll come back to. So the major one in the higher ed, in my view, I mean, there's a number, right? So there's obviously sponsored scholars. There's all sorts of you know, exchange uh, research students, students from uh, Pacific and Timor-Leste. But the big one in this group, in my opinion, is that t and arrangement. And what we've seen over time in international education is that when government makes a policy change, and I don't want to simplify this too much, but generally the sector is like an under schools, um, under six a soccer team. They all run to where the ball is. I wonder whether over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to see T&E arrangements, twinning arrangements just go 
berserk overseas because they're going to be excluded from the cap, whether that might happen. Now, the other thing is what percentage or what population, and, and this is the really hard one to tell, of current twining arrangements, twining arrangements. So if you think about China, for instance, you know, there's t and programs scattered all over uh, China. If you think about Malaysia, Singapore, there's tons of T&E twinning arrangements already exist. We, you know, Australian universities offer, I guess, advanced standing or credit to a lot of these things. Will they now be more formalized into a twinning program? So there's a whole bunch of things in that space where I just think that's a really, really big one. I get the carve out because I think you don't want to disadvantage students that are, are have enrolled in a program offshore that will, for the want of a better word, matriculate into an Australian degree. So you don't want to disadvantage those. But I wonder whether this is going to drive a behaviour now, um, which is, I guess, not present at the moment. So, so that's the big one. Stuff would be on the list. Yeah, possibly not. Possibly not. So again, when you go back and you think the 145,000 in that cap, excluding the ones that we just spoke about, and there were 152 new higher education commencements in 23, overall, I think... Yeah, you know, there's got to be, what's the difference? 7,000 students there. There's got to be 7,000 students easily in that carve-out group, if not more. So one could argue at a top-line level, what's the purpose of this? And then the next question then becomes, if it's not about overall numbers, then it becomes about distribution. So when we start talking about individual university or individual institution caps, now we're talking about a real managed system where the pool hasn't really shrunk at all, but now we're looking at moving students around. And as Andrew Norton points out, that's a really, really dangerous thing to do because students who want to go to a prestige university who, for the want of a better phrase, is over-enrolled at the moment in the view of the government, those students may not actually want to cascade into another institution in Australia. They might just go to the UK and, and seek another prestige university. So Andrew's view and, and is very much that cap of 270, we probably won't even hit that because of that very reason. It's a very valid sort of preface, I guess. So yeah, it'll be mate, interesting times, interesting times. And again, all of this is predicated on the bill passing in its current form or not impacting the minister's ability to do this. Watch this space. And without a doubt, we'll touch on that when we talk, start to talk about the ESOS Senate hearings that have been going on. Mm -hmm. But maybe look, we dive into to the vet side of things because there... Yeah, this is where the pain hits, mate. There's a lot of pain coming for, for that sector, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. So look, vet providers at the moment, sorry, the cap, well, the planning level is about 95,000. In 2023, there were 190,000 new commencements. And our year-to-date May data, there was 103,000. So if you think that's just under half a year and it's already exceeded sort of that, that planning level area, that's going to be significant. There's a, probably a lot of pain to come from that. There is, I guess, you know, some leniency, if I can put it that way, for vet providers who also educate domestic students. So look, Tracy Harris did a, a wonderful job at, at analysing this. And I'll just read this this paragraph that she did. Private vet sector providers will also be penalised if they have high concentrations of international students. In letters sent to, to providers by the Secretary of the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, and seen by the Koala, private vet providers with an international population of more than 80% in 2023 will have a lower 2025 allocation. Private vet providers with an international student population of less than 80% in 2023 will have an enrolment limit set at a approximately their 2024 level. When you think about that and then you think about the overall cap, I think there's still quite a bit of work to be done in that space to uh, to ensure both of those align. I'd be fascinated to see all of the modelling on this because obviously you've got a huge number of Crycos registered providers and they all have individual numbers and the like. You just kind of wonder down to what level of granularity the department is on on this stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting you say that because that was a topic of, of a session in the day two hearings of the Senate committee. And I tell you, between the Department of Education, Department of Workplace Relations and Treasury, they all held that very, very close to their chest. They weren't keen to, to use the word modelling at all. They all indicated that they had done some work that was provided to cabinet. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's got to be models around here. And, and I think there was, I don't want to overstate it, but at one point, there probably was a, a suggestion that significant work had been done for Cabinet and there had been different scenarios planned. So whether we want to use the word modelling or work, yeah, it's, it's pretty much a by-the-by point, but there's definitely been a lot of work being put into this that will probably never see the light of day because I think they're trying to tie that up into a Cabinet process, which is sealed. I can't even remember what the date is, but what is it? Is it 10 or 20 years until Cabinet documents are released? Yeah, 20 years. So we may not find out for for some amount of time. And you know, and can I add that the frustration of the senators who were asking the questions around this was clear to be seen as a 
spectator watching, I was also frustrated. You know, this is our national policy and we're not even being able to talk publicly about some of the modelling and some of the considerations that, that may be being taken into into account. Yeah, quite quite, quite incredible. Uh, shall, shall we move on? Uh, so, and this is like, Len, just, just a pause here. Uh, are we ready to move on to the ESOS stuff or did you want to touch on the... Yep. Okay, so let's let's just hove, hove straight in. Um, thanks, Len. So that's probably a good point for us to transition from the, the CAPS announcement onto uh, the second day of the hearings into the ESOS Act. Dirk, my, my biggest question, did you have the popcorn out again? Did you have the day on the couch <laughs> chewing popcorn? <laughs> you know what? I actually got up early this time. I was prepared and uh, and I was behind the computer and I, and I had it running. Look, unfortunately, uh, there was no visual on the, on this one. This one has been taken place at... at in Sydney at New South Wales Parliament House in the Macquarie Room, if, if you've ever been in there. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was sound only. So it certainly wasn't as engaging, I think, as the, as the first day of hearings. But I tell you, I mean, the content was was really good. I mean, I think we spoke earlier about, you know, some of the media performances that, were, that we've seen in the past. The calibre of people in our industry is somewhat understated and intimate nature of knowing people in our sector sometimes allows us to, to gloss over just how good these people are. So, you know, just, I mean, running throughout the day, I mean, people like Ant Bagshaw, Paul Harris from the IAU, you know, formidable performances. Tracy Harris from, again, someone who we, we've both spoken to on the podcast. We've got great relationships with, you know, she writes for the Koala. Again, outstanding performance. Andrew Norton, all of these people just back up and back up and back up and they're, and they're outstanding individuals. The one that I want to make a special mention of, if I can, is the newly appointed, um, I think he's been in the job four weeks, Vice Chancellor of Western Sydney University, George Williams. Uh, George is a constitutional lawyer, I believe. And mate, I've got to tell you, I've seen a few things of George's over the time. I, I'm, and I, you know, tap, I kind of put my hand up and say I'm a, I'm an alumni of Western Sydney, so I kind of do watch that space, you know, with uh, great interest. It's close to my heart, and I love seeing um, the role that Western plays in Greater Western Sydney, which is, which is where I grew up. But this guy, this guy just nails it. He just, I don't know what it is. Every time he speaks, he just seems to to nail it. I mean, he puts Western Sydney before the university. He, he very much has a view that the, that the university is there to serve the community. And that rung through again in his opening statement. Being a constitutional lawyer, I think, puts him in a unique place to be able to read legislation, interpret it, and be able to give constructive feedback, shall we say. So in his opening statement, and, and a number of people have posted on LinkedIn to say it was one of the most impressive opening statements they've ever seen, he just Took it down. I mean, he starts off by you know literally just saying this bill is remarkable in many respects, and then literally point by point by point, you know, from ministerial power overreach to just drafting points, just just took it down and was able to give concrete examples around how you know the the ministerial power in this bill would be akin to something in a in a, in a biosecurity bill. Like it's just that the overreach is, is, was just phenomenal. He finishes it off with a really an analogy. I'm not sure what, what the best way is, but I've heard it before from many other people. But the way George phrases it was just really, really good. And he says something along the lines of, imagine in the mining sector, if the government told miners how much they could export, tear up their contracts if they exceed it by exporting just one ton more than, than what it needs to be. Given that contracts are negotiated 12 months, two years in advance, it's unbelievable. Like it's just you wouldn't you, you could not you could not even begin to think that that could happen in the mining sector, but it's happening in education, or that or that's what the proposal is for the legislation. An amazing performance by by the vice chancellor, and really look forward to seeing him progress over the last over the next little bit. I thought one of the interesting comments that he raised was around the constitutionality of it, and the fact that the Commonwealth cannot discriminate between states and yet northern territory is a territory but they're looking to discriminate on a geographical basis and what i read in the koala the suggestion was that that ain't constitutional boy quite possibly i mean and so this is the real again it's a really good point that you raise and, and one that i was going to bring up later two weeks a week and a half ago just be so last weekend the northern territory went to election a few days before the election the chief minister of the northern territory announced that the NT was exempt from caps. Now, no one else could actually verify that. Information that went out yesterday to providers in that carve-out, you'll notice that there was no formal recognition of location in those carve-outs. So there has certainly been a lot of discourse publicly by the minister about regional universities. Obviously, Scott Bowman and the team 
if I can say, Team NT have been pushing really hard about the NT's case. And it's a valid one, right? It's a really valid one. But there was no mention of location formally in the in the communication. When you say it's unconstitutional, boy, maybe that's something that got picked up out of the hearing and, sort of, and got parked around the corner because there's certainly no mention of it. What I suspect will happen is that regional institutions and ones in locations of choice will certainly benefit from those caps or from those individual institutional caps. But I don't think it will be publicly noted or will be rationalised in the way as, articu- as, as articulated by, by the Vice Chair of Western Sydney, George Williams, in his discussion. Probably on that point. There's no need to. They have full control over who, the, where they set the caps for who. So there's actually no need for them to put their, their neck out and do, do anything on a geographical basis. So, yes, yeah, very well. Yep. But it'll be really interesting, Rob. It'd be really interesting just to hear what the public sort of, what the discussion is around inner city campuses versus regional campuses over the next couple of weeks, because because you're right. And I think, you know, again, George brought up a, an amazing point in that. Interestingly enough, if I can go on about the new vice chancellor, Sarah Henderson, the senator from, I believe, Victoria, asked her first question, asked him about his pay, his new pay. The relevance of that to a Senate committee that's looking at the ESOS bill, I'm not sure. However, apparently it not only seems this guy's impressive and you know a smart, deep thinker who communicates very well, he seems like a pretty good bloke too because apparently he's taken a haircut from most vice chancellors, was quite happy to, I guess, view with the discussion with the chancellor and the chancellor search committee that his role at Western Sydney now be pegged to a secretary role within, I believe it's the federal government, and have his pay, I guess, uh, essentially benchmarked against that. Whether this is an, will be an ongoing trend amongst new appointee vice chancellors, I'm not sure, but it was a really interesting point that Henderson rose, and he answered it very, very well. And I've got to say, if this is, you know, if this is going to be the trend, then that whole discussion about high VC pays may just, we might just be starting to see the the change in this space now. Yeah, seems like a seems like a, a smart, well well communicated, and uh, and good guy. I definitely enjoyed that. I was also intrigued that the senator would jump in on salary and then followed up with a question. To, who, who was the VC that she asked later? Was it a Scott? You said from Sydney, yeah. Yeah, yeah Mark Scott hmm. uh, followed up asking him questions. You, you wonder what the rationale is behind that in an international education committee, as you say. I think if I'm reading the tea leaves right, it's about pointing out the, the top end of town. Yeah. Yeah, and, and certainly the questions that ensued around, I think it was a $750 million investment in a medical research centre. The senator used the used the term gold plating, which the vice chancellor of Sydney, um, Mark Scott, didn't take very well. I don't think gold plating was probably the right phrase, but I think there's certainly a view that elements of government are trying to paint the group of eight at, as the top end of town and that you know their their over reliance on international students is allowing them to or the perceived spending money in places or excessive money in places which you know Scott answered really really well I mean he you know he basically said you know we are the top end of town and we don't shy away from that and seven hundred and fifty million dollars to a medical research facility which is only present in a couple of places around the world is something that this country needs and, and Sydney needs and the research institute needs to which he didn't really leave the senator much room to manoeuvre so it was a really good response and a really interesting is the word argument or back and forth if i can put it that way i don't know why institutions should have to be apologizing for this sort of stuff right we should be proud and you know even just connecting that through to this issue of caps and and the like i mean personally i don't have any issue if there are to be caps on international students if a the consultation is done properly and everything's set and everybody knows well in advance but b more importantly that the australian government funds our higher education institutions to the level that they need to be funded to do all of this research and other work that they do, which is vital for our country. You know, if they were actually putting in the bickies, then I would have less of an issue with what's going on. But if you're not prepared to put the cash on the table, then, you know, they should just get the heck out of the way. Yeah, no, I agree. I did. I saw a post on LinkedIn. I, I think that the situation is when you look at The distribution of international students. Obviously, urban centres are favoured over regional communities. And I remember once thinking about this when I was at Murdoch here in Perth. We would go and we would go to India and we would go to one of their smallest towns. And when I say smallest towns, with an airport, you know, all the rest. It was looked at as as a really small place, tier three city, et cetera, et cetera. I don't mind saying it, Rajkot in uh, in Gujarat. The population of Rajkot in Gujarat was about 1.6 million from memory. 
that was bigger than Perth. When you put on it in that scale, so even tier three cities in India and other tier three cities across Asia are still bigger than some of our major cities. Imagine going from a town of, you know, let's say, you know, not to mention, let's say Rajkot, 1.6 million, where you can get pretty much anything any time of the day. And then, or, you know, let's say a place like Shanghai or Beijing or Mumbai or Delhi or Singapore or any one of these cities, and then going to a town, which don't get me wrong, I, I quite like, but might have a population of 25, 40,000. Things shut at five o'clock. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. I actually quite quite like it. And the community that that presents is great. But it's a big stretch from, you know, inviting a kid from, you know, one of those kind of scenarios in Asia into one of those regional communities. And, you know, you talk about culture shock, you know, imagine a, you know, for the want of a better word, a country bumpkin from, you know, I won't mention any towns, but let's just say Dubbo because there's no going to Shanghai for the first time. That's culture shock, but we sometimes forget about that culture shock in reverse. So obviously, you know, going to an urban centre where there's a population and a lifestyle which is consistent or semi-consistent with what you're used to at home uh, makes a lot of sense. All right, so Dirk, at the end of all of that, what's the shakeout? Like, where are we likely to fall? What's likely to happen next? So the Senate committee, I believe, is due to wrap up by the... 6th of September. And there's two parliamentary sitting times, once in September, once in October, I believe. It really depends, I guess, on what the Senate committee report comes out with. And then obviously it will go to the floor of the Senate for voting, whether there's any amendments proposed. You know, these are the conversations that I've had in the last sort of 48 hours. If you look at the Senate committee hearings and you've been kind of, you know, if you've spent the time kind of watching them, there hasn't been too many people in support of this bill or particularly around the CAPS area, the ministerial power area. So, and Senator Faruqi is is very keen to see that scraps go, that seems pretty obvious. In response to the announcement yesterday, the Liberals came out and said that they're not opposed to CAPS, but they will be looking at the detail. There's, I guess, a couple of scenarios. So the first scenario is this bill just passes and the the two days of Senate hearings were a waste of time and nothing's going to come back in here to improve the bill. And it's a political manoeuvre and boom, we're off to the races bill passed and all of this stuff gets gets passed. The other is that there's amendments and if there are amendments, it will need to go back to the House for passing as well. So that will delay that. Depending on those amendments and how the sitting times work, there is probably still a chance that it will be passed beforehand. And again, what those amendments mean, we don't know. Or there's a chance that it may not get voted on before the end of the year. And if that's the case, it's dead in the water. Now, where this is really important is if it passes, the government has made a commitment to get rid of Ministerial Direction 107. Now, I just want to be really clear to listeners. 107 is about the minister directing the visa office to process based on their risk profile. There's been a lot of people talking and a lot of people, sorry, talking about slow assessments, have been talking about inconsistent assessments. Now, the slowness might get taken out by someone who might be in a lower assessment level, but I think there's two things here. So one is around the assessment levels will still exist, but they just won't be applied to visa processing. And so that's a really important distinction. If it gets scrapped, then we go essentially go back to the same system. So anyone in an assessment level three or two will be processed in the same way. I'm, I'm assuming on a first come first serve basis along with assessment level ones. So the lower end of the spectrum, if I can put it that way, or some of the smaller providers who potentially have found inequality in this system because they might have a lower assessment level based on a few people leaving the institution or whatever else, they're now back in the main group. So that's a good thing. However, if this doesn't get passed, 107 stays. So we might see the same sort of pain that we've been seeing for the last little bit right up until at least the end of the year, if not further. That's kind of where we sit at the moment, Rob. It's, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, A, in the Senate committee, B, on the Senate floor, And then whether the bill gets passed, and if it does, and caps come in, 107 goes. If caps don't get in, 107 likely stays. And I think that's the battle the industry needs to start picking up. If the bill doesn't pass, how do we make 107 workable? Because it's not workable at the moment, clearly. So net result is kind of similar in both scenarios, isn't it? I mean, there's still an impact. It's not like if the legislation doesn't get through, then everybody sort of wipes the sweat from their brow and says, whew, that was a close call. But in fact, we've still got fights to come. And once again, we've talked about this. It's hard to, it's interesting to think about this in the context of an election. You know, I I sometimes wonder when I saw the announcement and see the politicians standing out there talking about this, I don't half wonder if this is for them getting ready for an election saying, look, this, we've done it. You know, we said we're going to do it. We've done all this work. You know, we've imposed this cap. Australian public, you can trust us. You know, everything's in good hands. Nothing to see here. And then at some point next year, 
you know, the 270 cap becomes 350 and 350,000, then we just go on as normal because an election has been held and is done. I know I'm maybe a bit cynical on that. No, man, I think, mate, I actually think you've nailed it. And I think that is the distinction. Is it about the numbers next year or, or is it about the framework that the government's imposing? And if we think about one example that was given to me recently was around the ARC funding. So if you remember under the Liberal government, there was a captain's call made by the minister about striking funding from certain projects. And the minister retains that power, but Claire's come in and said, oh, no, 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 you know, this needs to be independent, et cetera, et cetera. But he still has the power in legislation to overrule it if he wants. And I just wonder whether this whole process isn't necessarily about the numbers. It's about changing the framework and having the minister have the authority to be able to control it when he or she may like. Funny that. Ministers wanting more power. Who would have thunk it? Mm. (laughs) Shall we move on? And I'm glad it feels like we're bookending a little bit here. We started off with cheery news about AIEC and all the good stuff coming up in Connor's time. It's that time of year when IEAA, our International Education Association, is looking for skilled people, experienced people to lead various elements of the organisation. You want to talk us through the election that's uh, that's now opening up? Yeah, absolutely. So as you say, IEA, open elections, nominations are open and there's a whole series of points. So the first, uh, the first position open is a vice president. And now if you know about the IEA board, you will know that the vice president will serve a term for, I believe it's one year, and then will become the president. So a really important position right there. And there are three ordinary board members up for grabs as well. That is on the board and, and at the highest leadership position. They're also looking for network leadership convener positions for admissions and compliance group, for marketing and recruitment, for pathways, for scholarships and fellowships, for transnational education. And then for deputy conveners, again, admissions, compliance, learning abroad pathways, scholarships and fellowships, student life has two positions open, teaching and learning has two positions open, and one position for transnational education. Nominations close on Sunday, Sunday the 15th of September, not the 13th, the 15th, at 11.59pm. So you've got right up until just before midnight. And it is important to note that any nominee must be a current voting member and in good financial standing. Nominators and seconders must also be current financial and voting members. So you've got to be in the tent to, to make a difference. Uh, your nominators and seconders also need to be in the tent as well. Can I make a recommendation for those people who are listening who maybe haven't been involved in the IEAA before, maybe have gone to some events and things like that, because it, it looks kind of scary, these leadership roles, being a convener, a deputy convener, and obviously like the significant leadership positions are on the board. But if you're interested in that space, if you want to be involved If you really want to sort of push your skills, have a real think about one of those deputy convener positions as a beginning point, because good associations run on the quality and the effort of the people who contribute. And it's such a great way to put your toe into that water of contributing a little bit more on an industry basis, not just to your institution, to your day-to-day work, but really contributing to the industry. And deputy convener positions... You know, you're working with other people, another deputy convener, a convener, and you're getting that guidance and support. It's just such a fantastic way to start leveling up your your leadership skills and, and your personal network. So if you've never thought about it before, give it some thought. I highly, highly recommend it. Couldn't agree more. One of the things that always stands out to me for these positions is the oversight that you get on best practice and being in a position where you get to see what other institutions are doing how they're doing it, what really works. It's just intangible, A, for your own knowledge and and the way that you approach your own job and work in your own institution, but for your institution as well. I mean, the efficiencies gains without having to work through processes all the time because you know a a certain model has worked somewhere else. Just the exposure of that information is just so, so vital. So I couldn't agree with you more, Rob. And uh, as with all all of these things, as with AIEC, you know, the more you put in, the more you get out. So I um, couldn't recommend volunteering more. You would be amazed, you know, if you're interested in being in this sector and you know, building your career in international education, the boost that being involved with an organisation like IEA in that way is just enormous. It, it really, suddenly people know your name, they know who you are, they want to work with you. I, I just can't speak highly, highly enough. Maybe just to finish us up, 
today. Actually, we've got two little more things on our agenda, but WA Export Awards underway at the moment. Yeah, that's right. So the 36th year in a row, WA uh, have their Exports Awards and it's they've got 27 businesses that have been named in 13 categories. One of those categories, of course, is International Education and Training and there are three finalists. The Australian Technology College, Western Australia, the Engineering Institute of Technology and North Metropolitan TAFE. We certainly wish all three of those the best as they march towards the finalisation of those awards and the eventual winner. Any idea when those are announced? Mate, there's a gala a gala dinner that's being held on Thursday, the 19th of September. So, coming uh, up soon. Coming up soon. A couple more weeks. Good, good. And look, so to finish this up now, we've talked a lot about, when we're talking about international education, we've talked a lot about the inbound side here, about student recruitment, uh, international students, CAPS and the like. But of course, there have been some major changes that have been announced to the new Colombo plan. And in fact, I've managed to wrangle Kent Anderson, Deputy Vice Chancellor Global from the Uni of Newcastle, who's going to come on the podcast to break this down. Originally, we had thought we might weave it into this news episode, but there's just so much to digest. So please keep an eye out in your podcast feed for the special episode on the changes to the new Colombo plan. I understand a lot of people don't see a lot of the outbound side, but it really is the the other side of the coin. And the new Colombo plan has been the critical piece of that side of international ed for for the last decade. So these changes are quite significant. And so very lucky to have Kent joining us on the podcast to dive into those changes in a special episode. Well, hope you've enjoyed this flipped format for the news. So our guest in first and then followed, followed by the news. And look, if you've got feedback for us about Global Horizons, we always love to hear it. I mean, every time I run into people around the traps, people are always telling me different things, but I'd love to hear from you by email. You can just email me, rob at globalsociety, or one word, .com.au. Love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions for the podcast, that could be guests, it could be news. And of course, for all of your international education news, the news.com is your source of information and truth. And... Once again, Dirk, thank you for all the work you do keeping the whole industry up to date. You've been very busy lately. It's been a very, very busy couple of weeks, Rob, I don't mind saying. But no, mate, it's been great. Hopefully the the next couple of weeks won't be as intense. Fingers crossed. Good to see you, mate. See you next time. All right. Cheers, Rob. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by the Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, the Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.